The Business Journal understands the importance of protecting your networks, your intellectual property, and your assets. That's why we're the only media outlet in Colorado Springs with a dedicated reporter covering cybersecurity for business. Helen Robinson, who is here on the stage, um, is the reporter to go to if you want to know the latest information about how to safeguard your business. Whether you're in healthcare, retail, or manufacturing, she has covered um, cybersecurity from, from every angle. We're pleased to partner with the SBDC on this event, and we encourage you to pick up a paper and give us a read. We're the only business-to-business -business resource in the Pikes Peak region, and our goal is to provide information to you that can aid your business decisions. If you want to know more or to subscribe, please go to csbj.com. Helen will be interviewing Margaret Graves this afternoon. She is the deputy, Federal Deputy Chief Information Officer of the United States. As Deputy CIO, she oversees an IT portfolio of $5.4 billion in programs. In addition, she manages the operations of the Office of the Chief Information Officer, which covers the functional areas of applied technology, enterprise architecture, data management, IT security, infra infrastructure operations, IT accessibility, budget, and acquisitions. Big job. <laughs> <laughs> so Big prior, <laughs> prior to her selection as Deputy Chief um, Information Officer, Ms. Graves served as the Executive Director of the Enterprise Business Management Office within the DHS Office of the CIO. Margie has 20 years of experience in the management consulting industry. She has experience with systems engineering, business process re-engineering, strategic planning, financial management, mergers and acquisitions, and venture capital planning. She has an MBA from the University of Virginia, Colgate Darden Graduate School of Business Administration, and a BS in Chemistry, also from the University of Virginia. Please welcome Margie, and um, I look forward to hearing more about um, cybersecurity at the federal level. Thank you so much. <laughs> So Margie, you're in the Office of Management and Budget within the Executive Office of the President. What are the main mission areas, goals and objectives for the Office of the Federal Chief Information Officer? Well, the Federal Chief Information Office is actually a statutory office which has the responsibility for creating and promulgating policy in the technology world across the federal government. And also, I think we also work with the communities uh, to establish the kinds of uh, frameworks that you were seeing today, like the NIST framework for cybersecurity. Uh, we work across all federal agencies, uh, not only the 24 CFO Act agencies, but all, also some of the smaller agencies that are associated with the financial industry, like the SEC, et cetera. And um, ultimately, what we do also is we put forward legislation and work with Congress uh, to try to get uh, some of these issues addressed uh, on a nationwide basis. So what you see is we work with Congress uh, to, to uh, set the legislation. We put that into policy because we're allowed through statute to do that. And then we work with the agencies to create implementation pathways, which are some of the frameworks that you saw today. And how did you come to be at the summit today? Can you tell us a bit about your background? Sure. Um, I actually uh, started out in nuclear chemistry. Um, so uh, working in that field for a, a period of time, uh, it became clear to me that technology was probably at the base of most everything that I was doing. And so I did not study it as a discipline. I came into it as a necessity. Uh, so I ended up um, using it to support all the scientific methods and all of the uh, environmental cleanup and uh, those kinds of things that I was pursuing. But ultimately, when I went back and got my MBA, then I used it on the mergers and acquisitions side because technology is a true basis for making sure that you can actually get the synergies out of putting two companies together when they're, when they're actually on the pathway to being integrated. And then um, coming into the federal government was really about 9-11. Uh, uh, I was working in mergers and acquisitions and the consulting realm, and 9-11 happened. Uh, I was supposed to be in New York that day. I was not. I was in Washington, D.C., uh, but I lost clients. And then, of course, my father is a military officer, and he lost personnel at the Pentagon. 
So I think a lot of us at that point in time ask ourselves what we could do for our nation. Uh, I didn't at the time know what that might be. And then as luck might have it, uh, I had a friend who was working in the telecom industry uh, who was called upon to stand up Department of Homeland Security in one aspect. And he called me up and said, how would you like to be a part of the biggest merger and acquisition in the federal government history wow. uh, outside of DOD? So, um, and, you know, we put together 22 separate entities to form DHS. And it was in response to a crisis. Uh, but I spent my first um, 10 to 12 years uh, in the federal government at DHS from folding tables and chairs back to back, standing up a department from the very beginning with Tom Ridge at the, um, at the uh, helm uh, to what it is today, uh, which it has uh, more far-reaching responsibilities than it did even in the beginning. But it was response to a call to action and um, every step along the way, uh, technology was a part of that integration, and technology was, was the imperative. Um, but today, in my role at OMB, uh, what we have done most recently is, uh, just as recently as last year, uh, we established the President's Management Agenda. And if you go on performance.gov, there are two things that you can read. First of all, you can read the agenda itself. It has three pillars. Uh, it's IT modernization, data as a strategic asset, and the workforce of the 21st century. And those three elements resonate in the conversation that we were having today for the following reasons. IT modernization is clearly um, needed in order for you to have uh, the kinds of systems and the kinds of support you need from a technology standpoint that is actually cyber secure. Uh, data is your most critical asset, data on your customers, data about your products, intellectual capital. All of those things are used for, um, for running your business. And you can tell from the conversations on, uh, we've had today that any kind of uh, disruption of that data flow or compromise of it or misuse of it is something that you cannot afford. Um, so that's a pillar of that president's management agenda. And then finally, uh, I'm here not only today but for Monday and Tuesday because I'm talking to a number of the educators in your community that are creating that workforce of the future. Uh, when uh, Stan and company uh, came to DC just recently and brought a number of uh, their community partners with them, uh, we had a very cogent discussion about how you create cyber aware communities. Not just creating cyber professionals, although that is part of it, you need to have cyber professionals that are uh, you know, true cyber hunters, you need to have people who are people who protect networks, and you also need to have coders and data scientists that protect the data. But ultimately, you end up um, having to educate the entire public. And it's K through 12 on up. That's where you start the conversation. It's almost built into your DNA as you move, uh, as you move through life. Um, the PMA addresses that. And then we have cross-agency priority goals that take that down to the actual tactical execution. And then the partners that we work with. Um, I come from the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, people are familiar, I'm sure, with US CERT, uh, which does the uh, alerts and warnings on uh, things that are going on in cyberspace and nefarious activities and how people can, can actually respond to those. Uh, that's an information exchange. So that's also very critical. And then bodies like NIST that set standards and provide frameworks. But I think the, the real um, takeaway that I've had from some of the conversations I've heard today, uh, what we're doing at the federal government level is applying the same exact principles, but at a larger scope and scale. It may be more complex, and the tools and the capabilities that we use may be slightly different but the same exact principles apply. Protect your networks, protect your data, protect your devices, 
understand your access and control it with identity. Those are all common. So how can the voice of small business be heard most effectively in the federal CIO office? Well, there are many ways that uh, small businesses can actually interact with our office. Um, first of all, whenever we put out public policy, uh, we actually crowdsource comment. Uh, so all of these things are, are put out for the public uh, to respond. Uh, they are also um, able to respond through uh, some of the larger organizations. So if you belong to some of the, uh, you know, the larger national IT organizations or if you belong to uh, medical professionals organizations or any of those um, entities that actually uh, speak on behalf of a collective, that's another voice that you can have. And then interaction like I'm having today, um, we always appreciate being able to get out and talk to communities specifically because then and only then do you learn what's on their minds. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, you can get isolated uh, when you're inside the beltway, as they call it, uh, where I'm from. And uh, you need to understand what's happening uh, in the ecosystems. Uh, so that we can actually do the right things and so that we can communicate better, so that we can share that kind of information that sometimes only the federal government has access uh, to the kinds of, of larger forums, uh, but how we promulgate that information is, is really important. What are some of the federal policies that will affect small businesses, especially those with the one to 35 employee number? Well, I think uh, one of the things that we've discussed today, and I think Daniel probably was the, was the uh, speaker that spoke uh, about most of the frameworks. Um, every time that we, that we put those in place, uh, we want to make sure that, um, that they work. So uh, we're looking for test beds and for um, the kinds of forward-leaning uh, interaction to be able to uh, test these theories and the things that we're trying to put out on the ground. Um, so again, that's one of the reasons why I'm here. The kinds of policies that are affecting um, small businesses in general include um, uh, the national cyber strategy. So you'll see a pillar in the national cyber strategy that is about um, maintaining uh, commercial viability and ensuring that uh, true commerce occurs. Uh, that's a, that's only, there are only four pillars in that national cyber strategy. That's one of the key pillars. So the ability to be able to have free and open trade and commerce, to be able to, um, to own and grow uh, innovative businesses over time, um, those are the kinds of things that we're attempting to promote. I think innovation is something that we truly um, try to encourage in OMB in general and uh, looking at different ways where the federal government can actually engage with uh, private sector in producing products and services that serve the American citizens. I mean, we're a customer just like everybody else. Uh, we are looking for contractual mechanisms for um, uh, test beds, for the ability to engage with the private sector uh, to develop products that grow our economy. And to have that as one of the major pillars in the cybersecurity strategy, to ensure that that business and commerce growth is not disrupted uh, by any kind of uh, cyber threat is, is truly important. So how is the federal CIO and OMB working to streamline communications of these policies with small business? The ability to be able to, um, to take these frameworks and put them into action is really where you see, I, I, you know, I get energized by that. You see it at, you know, where the rubber meets the road. I saw it in every conversation that I actually um, was able to sit in on today. Uh, it's no different at a federal agency. I'll give you an example at DHS. We were talking all day long about a major cyber threat, a major threat vector is through email. Uh, email clicks. I mean, it sounds very simple, but ultimately it puts malware into, into your environment. 
It can uh, actually be used for, um, uh, you know, for scamming. It can be used for a number of things. And at DHS, I'll, I'll tell you how this played out. I'll give you a story so it perhaps, you know, can illustrate that this happens in every place and time. Uh, we had a number of professionals who were in um, the customs department who were responsible for trade negotiations. And they traveled uh, with the president uh, and they set policy in these areas and they were constantly on the international circuit negotiating and talking about trade agreements with our international partners. And there was an uptick in fishing events right before any of these international conferences. Yet our executives, I don't think, truly understood what that meant. So the story that we had to tell, we had to take it to the executive suite and we had to say, okay, these are the folks that have been targeted over the last two or three weeks. They are the exact same people who are going to this international conference. The kinds of conversations that they're having in email concern the negotiating strategies that they're gonna use at these conferences. So what are these nefarious characters after? They're after the intellectual capital. They're after the thought process. They're after competitive advantage. Um, so what I want people to understand today is it is, it is not that different anywhere. Uh, it is the same threat and the same imperative that we have to address. Uh, our communication uh, through telling these stories like the one that I just told, uh, is the same as the one I just heard upstairs, where Trevor was talking about his, his father being targeted on a scam, you know, through an email. Uh, all of those stories that we tell are the way that people start to embed this in their psyche and understand that those are the kinds of things that are out there and then we can band together and actually do something about them, some of the best practices you saw today. So what training and education opportunities are available through the federal government for small businesses and for citizens? The Stop, Think, Connect um, campaign uh, that is actually uh, made up of a consortium of federal agencies that are heavily involved in the cybersecurity realm uh, is one of the key elements of the strategy. Uh, it includes DHS and all of the um, alerts and warnings and the situational awareness that they have. And when you look at you go to US CERT, and I go about once a month to see uh, what kinds of changes they've made in that particular uh, watch floor. They have a watch floor that's inclusive of all the critical infrastructure across the United States. So particularly in the telecom industry, like AT&T and Verizon and others, um, they have situational awareness uh, that can be spread. Uh, there are certain things that are intelligence related that can't be shared, but to whatever extent you can provide a, what we call a terror line, which is everything that's below this line can be shared with the public so that they can be prepared. Uh, that is very critical. So U.S. CERT does that. And you heard um, at the noon conversation today, too, that there are not-for-profits that actually partner with some of our, our agencies that are involved in law enforcement, particularly FBI, uh, that also will provide alerts and warnings. Uh, they're about normal systems that we use on a daily basis, but they're always about phishing attacks and campaigns also that are more ubiquitous and are affecting the entire economy as a whole. Uh, those are two areas where you can uh, educate yourself. And in the, the Stop, Think, Connect compendium, if you, if you go online and you look at it, there are two or three sections that are specifically targeted to small business. And those um, areas, I clicked through them the other day when I knew I was coming here, uh, to make sure I knew exactly uh, what was being presented there. Uh, they even take it down to the, the poster level, where if you want to do a campaign in your office, they will give you the, the posters you should put on the wall to keep people situationally aware. They will tell you what the, 
the educational curriculum should be. I know in DHS we used to run fishing campaigns where we would actually test and see if people would click on something within our environment and we would use tools to do that. Um, the kinds of tools and uh, capabilities that you have access to in the commercial world is also very important. So I know even though there are a lot of small businesses here today, some of those small businesses are actually providers of these kinds of services to this community. And they're very integral in um, educating uh, people on the frameworks and educating, you don't have to be an expert in these elements to be able to have a conversation about the outcome that you want. Because the outcome that you want, uh, the technical professionals can get behind you and give you that outcome. I would imagine most small businesses work with uh, payment organizations, you know, things like PayPal and things of that nature. Uh, know your providers, uh, know that they are cyber secure and, and actually ask their help. Uh, because there is no bright line between where your business begins now and the service providers that you use in order to deliver your business, there really isn't. Uh, it's one continuous flow of information and you're only as good as your weakest link. So it's important to understand the entire delivery chain of your business uh, and each point at which uh, that information has to be protected. So let's talk about a shortage of resources for addressing cybersecurity. I know that came up um, when some of the community leaders from the Springs visited UNDC recently. Mm -hmm. um, how are institutions um, such as the state and federal government, as well as private sector companies, addressing this challenge? The reality of, of this equation is you're just you're never going to have enough uh, resources to address all the threats. Uh, if you look at any of, of the frameworks that we've put together, uh, and you really can get a dry read if you want to read NIST 853, okay? Uh, but the, the point of 853 was to truly gather all of the possible um, touch points that you might have where something bad could occur. And so when they, when they list the controls, and there are over 3,000 of them, and it's really daunting, uh, it really behooves us to look at the primary categories and to, to, to look at what the intent is. So there are a bunch of controls that are associated with identity management. Not all of them are applicable to your business. So pick the ones that are most important to the kinds of data that you have and the way it actually moves. Number two is, um, when you're looking at those categories, know that uh, you don't have to go all the way to the right. It's all, the way, it's all about risk management. Uh, the way that we are talking about um, compliance or good cyber hygiene in the government today uh, used, to be, used to be all about going uh, as far and as fast as you can and spending as much as you could. We know that we can't do that, so we've got to concentrate on, from the intelligence that we have, what are the most important threat vectors for this particular set of data, and then ultimately, how do we spend money on the controls to protect that? So you don't have to do all the controls, you have to do the ones that make the most sense, and you have to spend your money where the risk is most prevalent for your business. So if the risk is most prevalent for your business in customer data, then you have to make sure that your PII is protected. That's just one example. Um, the extreme would be if, uh, if you try uh, to do everything and be all things to all people, you will never be able to do that. So you've got to pick your spots. Uh, the resources in the federal government are limited also. And so what we've uh, ended up doing is taking that risk framework tying it back to intelligence, saying these are the more, most important things we should address. And then ultimately, uh, when we address those, we have to make sure that we are sharing those resources. So there are a number of agencies that work together in, a common, in common business practices. For example, in DHS, 
Uh, we work together with the State Department on visas. We work together with the Department of Justice on criminal activity. We work together with um, a lot of the other uh, response and recovery organizations like HHS and HUD when there are floods and hurricanes. Uh, if you look across that ecosystem, it's imperative that we share our data and so we can't have it stovepiped in systems and we cannot get into a situation where we're not sharing the applications platforms also because ultimately it doesn't allow you to do your business in the best way possible and to respond to the public. And then uh, it also ensures that you have uh, duplication in terms of what you're spending. Uh, so we are very interested in uh, making sure that there are shared capabilities, shared platforms, shared cybersecurity protections. Um, and I would say that in a community that's as tight knit as Colorado Springs, uh, that there should be consortiums of this nature uh, that you can actually uh, pull together through something uh, like the small business community and, uh, and self-select into those consortiums and then share resources uh, to increase your buying power. We do that in the federal government. It's on a larger scale, uh, but we certainly don't have the resources to do everything that we need to do. So I would suggest that, um, that there should be programs uh, that could actually um, uh, you know, buy these kinds of, of capabilities from the commercial market and to be able to leverage them writ large across, across multiple entities. Are there, at the state level, are there any other ways that we haven't touched on that OMB is working with Colorado's cyber ecosystem? Um, many of the ways that we're working uh, include changing our own approach uh, particularly to uh, something that uh, many of the cyber companies in this area, big and small, uh, would love to talk about, which is changing our approach to procurement and uh, being able to actually engage with industry, to be able to support uh, research and development, so doing prize challenges. DARPA isn't the only agency that has a uh, science and technology budget. Every agency has a science and technology budget. To whatever extent we need to incubate things that are going on in local communities uh, that could be supported by um, uh, prize challenges, by grants, by uh, other resources that the federal government has that they can use to uplift uh, communities. I was speaking to a, a couple of gentlemen earlier today who said they had applied uh, for one of the, uh, the DHS cyber grants. Um, those Interactions are available and people should take advantage of those. Uh, it is difficult um, to do business with the federal government because there is a whole um, entire uh, FAR that's associated with how we do acquisition. But I would argue that that is changing and it's changing because we realize that the public-private partnership is truly where you get the innovation and by crowdsourcing, um, things that the federal government uh, would like to explore uh, and then ultimately uh, support is one way that we can increase uh, the economic flow and particularly of, of the small businesses uh, that are located in communities like Colorado Springs. Um, I know that I see every day how engaged Colorado Springs businesses are when it comes to cybersecurity. So I want to thank you so much for coming and talking to us this afternoon. Thank you. Are there any questions? We can certainly open it up. Yes, sir. Uh, a book was released this last month, AI Superpowers, and in it, it cites three studies on the consequence of machine learning and AI. In some range, there will be no consequence in 15 years, and some say there will be 40% of the jobs lost as they are being replaced by machine learning. Does the office have an opinion on what the future of machine learning and AI will be to society or the workforce? Uh, there is something being formulated as we speak. Uh, it is actually being formulated within uh, NSC. 
um, because there is a, a focus also on the, the cyber element of this. In terms of the workforce, uh, what we're talking about is, um, I would say, I use an expression when I'm talking about uh, increasing our technology chops, and that's called moving up the stack, uh, you know, getting higher and higher into the stack. Uh, on the people side of the equation, it's the, if you get certain jobs that are done in an automated fashion, then you reskill and you move people into the intellectual uh, equivalent of the extension of their capabilities as supported by what gets done in an automated fashion. And I'll give you an example. Um, I was recently up in uh, New York and I had the opportunity to see IBM Watson um, and the use of uh, AI to be able to uh, work in the medical field. And one of the things that they did was they showed us a, a, a video of um, doctors who were trying to diagnose uh, rare diseases that were not seen on a regular basis. And uh, the way that they showed how the doctor was actually able to get to a diagnosis faster Instead of six days where the person might actually succumb to this disease, it was more like six hours using AI to search the symptoms of and, and uh, the diagnoses that have been associated with those symptoms of the global universe. But the doctor is sitting with this patient in an intimate setting and is the person of trust sitting in front of this individual, but supported by knowledge that no one individual uh, can possess in a short time frame that is necessary to kind of uh, address something as critical as a diagnosis. I also saw it matching um, cancer patients with clinical trials. Again, uh, no one doctor uh, can know all of the clinical trials that are available at any given time, uh, even within the United States, no matter how good your doctor may be. Uh, so being able to um, match a person who has a, um, a rare form of cancer uh, with the appropriate clinical trials. Uh, again, it was an enhancement of knowledge and then people actually be, being able to go further and farther uh, into the human element and the delivery of the human element um, as aided by technology. So that's really the, the concept. Um, what that requires is that we, uh, we aid people in getting to that next level. Uh, and that is one of the, of the um, areas of reskilling uh, that's going to be addressed uh, in that third pillar that I was talking about, which is the workforce of the 21st century. I know my boss, um, Margaret Weikert, uh, she is going forth and asking for funds from the federal government uh, to address that particular um, paradigm. So I think uh, there's a lot of things going on right now that I think you'd be pleased to know are um, are pushing toward that uh, let's let artificial intelligence do what artificial intelligence can do and then up the game on the human side of the equation by having people use those capabilities and then go further and faster. Mm -hmm. As a follow-up to Neil's question, um, oh. as a follow-up to Neil's question, um, there's only one Watson at this point that I know of. Mm -hmm. Is that in the cybersecurity end of it, can it be plugged into the internet and then worldwide doctors input the causal effects that are being seen in one patient so that Watson works 24 hours for thousands of people instead of one random person who happens to have a connection to IBM? Yeah, I think, um, I, I believe that the way that they've set up the service is that uh, the anonymized data uh, can be pulled from multiple arenas. You have to have like at least a, a um, core um, center of gravity 
of enough data to actually be able to draw conclusions from it. So yes, um, that would need to be a business model that could be explored. Uh, IBM, of course, is in business for business sake. Um, altruism is good, uh, but I'm altogether sure that uh, there are corporations that would, um, uh, would be willing to look at business models that would get more data into the equation and, um, and allow that to expand over time. Yes? I don't want to monopolize things, but I'll back again. I, I had a second question, not, not any mention today, and I do not know how it fits into this, but no mention of the word net neutrality. And I'm wondering, is, is there an aspect of net neutrality that we as consumers or we as people who help with business development should know about related to cybersecurity, what the impact of it might be or, what the, or whether it's not even a factor? Net neutrality is, um, is more about, uh, again, the business model of, of what you get to see and when. Um, it is not necessarily, in my knowledge, related specifically to cybersecurity. Um, but from a business standpoint, um, it again is a it's an economic model uh, that would have to be uh, addressed. Um, it's different for uh, I know that the administration has a position on that. And, um, and it's really not my position to comment on that. Yes, sir. Thank you for being here. A couple questions. One, what do you see the biggest threat? Are we combating it well? This one question, combating it well. And what do you see changing with those threats with, with regards to AI or cybersecurity? Mm -hmm. And then the second question is, Obviously, you have the opportunity to see many um, exciting things. What's the most exciting thing you've seen in the last, in, during your tenure? Okay. The first one is actually one that we started talking about upstairs uh, when we were talking about uh, a scamming um, uh, phishing threat that had been uh, clicked on and, and had resulted in a bad outcome. We talked about, over time, defense in depth. Defense at your perimeter, at your network layer, uh, defense at your application layer, defense at your platform layer, and defense at your data layer. Uh, we all know, as technologists, that uh, 5G and other things are coming, uh, that that paradigm is likely to be um, turned on its head and shifted. Uh, in the sense that um, it's going to be all about data and data flows. It's going to be internet as transport, the importance of encryption, the importance of device management and identity management um, are going to be very much the wave of the future, and particularly identity management. Uh, is this a person uh, that I trust? Is, it, is that person that I trust actually that person? And then ultimately, should that person be working with this particular data? And then the data flows are going to be encrypted and uh, across uh, open channels uh, more so than they ever have been in the past as, as the network topology changes. Um, so that's going to happen. Uh, we need to be prepared to change our focus. We're going to be living in both for quite a while, one foot in, one foot out. Uh, but we're, we're going to have to absolutely be aware of, um, of that change because uh, if we're not out in front of it, uh, it's going to uh, provide a whole new set of threats. The threats uh, that I see on a regular basis, ironically enough, are not uh, particularly the most uh, sophisticated actors are not the ones that are most um, prominent. Uh, they cause more damage when they actually happen and they go after uh, information that is important to life, limb, safety, and state secrets. So that is, of course, the damage 
uh, from that standpoint is much wider. However, um, the kinds of things I see more regularly are the, the things we talked about today because there's so much opportunity, unfortunately. We haven't closed our doors. We haven't figured it all out and we haven't uh, lined up our, our issues as we should have. Um, I'm really most interested in uh, the mission space within the federal government and my best days are when I can actually see that in action. So I'll give you a couple of, of um, examples. Uh, one was the response to Hurricane Sandy and um, uh, meeting people on the worst day of their lives and then trying to help them recover from a natural disaster is not only heart rendering because it can happen to any one of us at any given time, but the ability to apply technology and public-private partnerships to that equation um, was probably uh, the most rally around the flag uh, moment I'd had in quite a while because we were working with Walmart and working with uh, logistics companies and working with supply companies to be able to get all of the uh, necessities of life to those people in a rapid fashion. Then we were working with uh, technology to create, I don't know if anybody's ever used a, a, an app called Gas Buddy, but it usually helps you find your, uh, your cheapest gas or your, or your closest gas station. Uh, but in this particular case, we took that exact technology and we determined which gas stations were actually going to even have gasoline at any given point. And we used those supply chains and the information that we were receiving from you know, the targets of the world, from the Exxons of the world, from all of the, of the uh, companies that we could partner with to get that information uh, to the people who were on the ground who were actually responding. And uh, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges was getting uh, generators and gasoline and the ability to transport all these supplies that we were talking about. And we put that app together with the Department of Energy and using commercial technology in 24 to 48 hours. Uh, so you know that when, I know this about this country and I know you do too, that when something happens where there needs to be an immediate response, all of, all of the differences in the daily chatter just goes away and it gets done. Uh, that's what really energizes me. Another one was um, the Boston bombing. At the time when we were trying to collect information uh, from people's social media and cell phones on the Boston bombing, which is the way they finally eventually caught the perpetrators, uh, that system crashed. Again, it's email, you know, people don't think much about email. But a lot of that uh, information was coming in over email people giving tips, crowdsourcing uh, people who were actually at the event to be able to design you know, what had actually happened and to be able to get law enforcement to be able to uh, take that information and turn it into an arrest. Um, what you didn't see behind the scenes was that was crashing because so much information was coming in in such a rapid fashion. The platforms couldn't handle it. So ultimately, uh, we addressed that uh, by putting together a cloud service uh, for the FBI. And Joe Klimovitz, who's their CIO, likes to tell this story. But you fast forward uh, to the Las Vegas shooting. We used social media in Boston, and we cut, probably cut the arrest time down to four days. But that was with crashing platforms and not being able to promulgate the information. Now we're in a cloud service, hours. Hours, we had that individual identified, we had that individual captured, and we had the situation uh, shut down. So what I consider a good day is when I see the application of technology, the uh, spirit of the people who work on the front lines of the delivery of the mission come together and the American public benefits. Um, that's really what I would consider to be why I'm here, why I, you know, 
It's certainly not the money. <laughs> and, um, and that's why a number of people who are in federal service, that's why they come, up, come to work every day. Uh, I know a, a friend of mine, uh, Marcy Jacobs, who just won an award for uh, creating a better interactive website and mobile app capability for veterans so they can actually access benefits, so they can do this like they deal with their banks on a daily basis. And that's really what it's all about, ultimately. <laughs> this one. Yes, sir. I really am patient. You don't have to run. Um, first of all, I've had the opportunity to ask several questions to some rather prominent figures over my, uh, I just separated from the Air Force after 10 years. Um, I'm very impressed with your answers. Oh, thank you. Normally people tend to skirt the actual meat of the question, so I really appreciate that. Um, on that note... Uh-oh. <clears throat> in concern specifically with the, the persistent threat, state actors, all of those really, really fun, very nice people that we all love so much, mm -hmm. Is there concern at the highest levels and I guess planning whatnot for what I hope never comes, an actual aggressive cyber attack on America as a whole? Mm -hmm. I know that the critical infrastructure list has come out, um, all the vendors from China, all those, you know, I read the, my newsfeed is horrible. Like, it's absolutely terrifying. Um, you, you can't sleep at night? <laughs> I, well, that, I can't do that either, but that's probably for different reasons. Um, I'm just curious if you could kind of touch on that subject. Um, I know most of it you probably can't talk about, but the that's pieces true. you can. Uh, but you see reflected in that national cyber strategy that was just published, um, a section on, uh, on critical infrastructure. Um, when I was at DHS, we addressed the 17 sectors and we worked with them on a regular basis. Um, there's, there's a consortium for banking. There's one for uh, the electric grid. Um, it is most definitely on the minds of, of the um, executives that I work with. It's also on the minds of um, of the people who create policy. Uh, speaking uh, to supply chain as one of your particular uh, examples that you stated there, um, there has already been action taken on a couple of companies uh, that had proved to be um, planting uh, certain kinds of uh, things in their products. Um, and ultimately, uh, that did get addressed with that one individual company, uh, but it's a bigger issue uh, because uh, when you think about that supply chain writ large, it's a procurement issue, it is a um, financial issue because you don't always know what holding companies own different aspects of the product line. It's, a, um, it's an issue on the part of the savvy buyer uh, being able to actually uh, test things and to uh, verify that there are no problems with the products. So I believe that there's going to be a, a, an extreme expansion, in my opinion, of, um, of companies that are going to come into the market uh, that are going to uh, have that as a service. Because there's going to be a need for that kind of verification over time. Um, and ultimately, it's also a legal issue because how do you prosecute um, thoughtfully uh, so that you're not simply uh, destroying companies, but you're getting the, uh, 
the value out of the message that you're sending, which is we're not going to tolerate uh, these kinds of of um, activities to go on in the global market. Uh, this is not just about the United States. It's about everybody, everywhere. Um, there is, everyone is going to be affected by this. Uh, the ability to pull all of those communities together is something that we're working on right now. I know I just recently um, went and spoke to the uh, Chief Acquisition Officers Council. We have councils within the federal government just like everybody else does in corporate America. There's a CIO council, there's a CAO council, there's a CFO council. But I, I recently did the round robin of going around and talking to these folks because everybody kept saying, that's an IT thing. But it's not. Um, IT can identify and IT can can uh, test and we can sound an alarm, but the buying and the, the um, legal actions and all of the things that are associated with this particular issue are things that we'll have to address as a, as a whole community uh, because there are elements of that um, in every discipline. <laughs> Uh, and that's the only way it's going to be tackled. I know that there are a couple of folks in Congress now, too, who are looking at supply chain legislation. Uh, so, you know, there might be more to come on that. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on the uh, Bloomberg story about the chip that supposedly can control a motherboard? There's been a lot of uh, cold water been thrown on that. And also, today's arrest, I don't know. It's an activation might not be able to I can't. I, you know, like, I, I will be honest, too. You know, when I actually can't speak about something, I will, you know, I will remain silent on that one. Um, but uh, there's always, um, what we need to do is we need to ferret out ground truth on these issues. We need to not be, um, uh, we need to be vigilant and we need to be thorough. Uh, when we're looking at these things to make sure that we um, we understand uh, all aspects of it and then and then go address the problem and that's that's really all we're trying to do I can't comment on it okay. yeah <laughs> thanks yeah yep I'm sorry um, so being a tech startup here in Colorado Springs, it's, um, and we've focused on the SMB market on purpose, um, I'm always fascinated at like uh, what we call the digital divide, right? It's mm -hmm. um, even in your examples, Target, Exxon, like high tech, how do we, or how does the federal government, instead of maybe just talking about pillars and education, um, what are some action items that can be done at the federal level to help bring high tech to the small business community so that we're not scaring them with cybersecurity. Oh, I better not get technical. You know, how do we bring technology down so that it's tangible, mm -hmm. um, but also like just available? Yeah. Well, one of the things that, um, that I've been privileged uh, to do over the last few years is to work uh, standing up the digital services organization within the federal government. So I've worked very closely with Matt Cutts and others along the way. Um, showing people how, not talking in technical terms, but showing uh, people the outcomes, the business outcomes, the, um, the kinds of, of um, advantages that could be supplied by technology. I mean, I was talking about it in terms of, of, of doctors, that's a different discipline. But in terms of business, um, how their business can be enabled by technology that is thoughtfully applied uh, is shown mostly, in my opinion, by demonstration. Um, so the kinds of projects uh, that you uh, take on uh, from an agile standpoint, and I'm sure if you're in the business, you you understand what I'm talking about. You know these small sprints uh, where you deliver these these nuggets of of capability to a consumer, something that they can feel, touch, use immediately, and then 
ultimately be able to um, rinse and repeat. The demonstration of it is, and the, uh, the actual use by the individual is the way that it actually gets um, less scary, I guess is what I would call it. Uh, and, and people, I, I know my, my CFO at DHS used to tease me a lot because, uh, you know, when we put together that, that resource prioritization that was based on threat and based on our resources and based on what we should address first within our own environment based on our data, um, he used to give me a hard time in saying, well, you know, you guys are, you CIO types, you're coming in and you're just doing a Soldier of Fortune magazine for, uh, for technology and you just want to buy stuff. Um, so tying it back to that business outcome was the exact conversation that I had with my CFO to help him understand that those guys that were going to the trade conference were losing negotiating uh, power if we were ever compromised. It's expressing it in business terms. Uh, and, and ultimately, that's not scary uh, if you express it in a way that people can understand that, OK, there is an, an answer for this. There, is a, there are tools. There are capabilities. There are people who can help you with it. There are people who know stuff who can come to the table and talk to you about it. And it doesn't have to be talked about in bits and bytes. I think that's really what I think the federal government has to lead the charge to, to show. Victor, hey, how are we for time? Oh, right. OK. So I've got a question. Over here to your right. OK. Hi. <laughs> I know we're hiding off in the corner. So, it's the bright lights. I can hardly, I, really, I can hardly see anything but that. Uh, you know, so we talk a lot about the technology. One of the things I'd like to transition to, uh, especially in your role, uh, is the governance. Um, so we know GDPR came out in Europe, and that, that satisfies a lot of European companies for uh, the protection of their privacy. Uh, California probably just passed the most pervasive um, you know, privacy law that takes into effect, uh, you know, first of um, first of January 2020, and so one of the things that I hear from small businesses, California, then New York, then Chicago, everybody's going to have their own cybersecurity privacy law. Why isn't the federal government leading the charge? instead of having all these complicated laws driven by different states? Is there a, a policy, is this a discussion at the federal level? Because a lot of states believe it should be driven. Um, privacy's here, privacy's in industry, privacy is not going away. Um, there's a lot of uh, organizations and state governments that think that the federal government should be driving those requirements. Uh, our federal CIO, Suzette Kent, uh, who's also my boss, I talked about Margaret Weikert earlier, she's one step above us. But um, Suzette uh, did raise the issue, and, and most of uh, the discussion right now is about uh, the fact that we don't want, let's forget states for a moment, let's talk about companies and how they start to actually respond in their products to these things, right? And do you want the Googles and the Facebooks and, and whatever company it is uh, responding in kind in their own element? And the answer is, uh, is that is not ideal. You, you have hit upon something that is, is correct. Um, it is an issue, it is just in, since all of this is, recent, it's just now in the beginning um, areas of discussion. Um, but people are aware uh, of the unintended consequences that could occur if there's not a common approach. Um, how far or how fast that would go, I, I, I can't really comment. All I can comment on is yes, you know, it has been raised um, 
certainly uh, is is an area where I think the federal, and again, personal opinion, where I think the, the federal government could take the lead and it would have a better outcome than if everybody is uh, not only in a state, but in a corporation interpreting what a state is saying and companies that are located in California but have a global reach, how they start to respond would lead the charge on, on some of these areas. So uh, you're right, there shouldn't, the fragmentation could be problematic. But we haven't, we haven't put it forth as a policy in any shape way. It's too new. I think people are discussing. I think that's probably good for today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.